Avi, we know how the universe began. It was incredibly homogenous. So those small differences here and there. And yet we look out today, we see unbelievable structure. We see stars and planets and galaxies and clusters of galaxies and large clusters and walls of galaxies and just a, a, a remarkable array of stuff. How do you account for it? That's a very good question. <laughs> Um, the universe following the Big Bang was filled with ordinary matter, as we know it, mostly hydrogen and helium, and dark matter. And early on, there were density inhomogeneities imprinted on this smooth background of, of matter. And as time went on, because of the unstable nature of gravity, the small inhomogeneities grew and became eventually collapsed into making objects. They first collapsed into sheets, and when the sheets intersected, they made filaments, and then material from the filaments uh, was channeled into the intersection of the filaments and made uh, galaxies and eventually groups of galaxies. Mm -hmm. Can we actually image this cosmic web of structure? The answer is yes, we can actually start at very early times. In particular, there is a new frontier in uh, observational cosmology of trying to image hydrogen, the hydrogen gas left over from the Big Bang, and the way that it, that structure developed in it. At very early times, when the universe was younger than a billion years old. Mm. The way to do that is by looking for a transition atomic transition of hydrogen that corresponds to a wavelength of 21 centimeters in the radio. And because of the expansion of the universe since that time that we are trying to observe, this wavelength is being stretched right. to meter uh, size comparable to the height of a person. Another way to put it is that the frequencies that one is looking for are um, about a few hundred million hertz. 100 megahertz. You find those frequencies on your radio dial. These are the kind of frequencies we are using for radio and TV communication. And so uh, the goal is to develop very large arrays of radio antennas, each of which that contains about 10,000 such antennas yeah. that look just like the antennas you can buy for a television reception and you put a large number of them across a field that is a kilometer size, and you link all these antennas and try to image the 21 centimeter transition of cosmic hydrogen from very early times. So simulate what it might look like if we did those imaging for that time, we're imaging the hydrogen that occurred. Now what, what years approximately are we dealing with that you're, you're seeking the image from? Uh, we are talking about um, uh, the time that preceded the first billion years. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of years after the Big okay. Bang. And we're imaging the distribution of hydrogen at that time because that would give us the first indication of how structures were being formed. Exactly. Now, the hydrogen early on was not uniform because of the inhomogeneities that resulted from inflation from the quantum fluctuations within inflation. That's correct. Right. But then when the first galaxies formed in the universe, they produced radiation that broke the hydrogen atoms in the vicinity of these galaxies. So there were holes generated artificially uh -huh. by the radiation uh -huh. in the distribution of hydrogen. And these cavities will appear as dark regions in 21 centimeter maps of the hydrogen. Because the hydrogen was burned out of that region. <laughs> exactly right. And so we can not only image the initial conditions of the universe, the density homogeneities that existed in it, but also the effects of the first galaxies to have formed inside this gas. Now, will there be any way to do this on a chronological basis, or will you just have one single snapshot? No, in Depends fact... Depends where you aim it or focus it. We are looking at the 21 centimeter transition of hydrogen. Yes. And this wavelength of 21 centimeters is being stretched by the cosmic expansion. So if you are looking at an earlier cosmic time, it's being stretched by a bigger factor uh, than if you are looking at a later cosmic time. So by observing different wavelengths different of radiation yeah, yeah. or different frequencies of radiation, right. we're able to slice the universe uh, at different 
redshifts or different cosmic times. And that's just like slicing Swiss cheese yeah. that has holes in it. You will be able to see that the patterns that you observe change. Or a, a, a CAT scan of a person, which is spatially, you're doing this type of cut temporally over exactly time. Exactly right. So it's three-dimensional. We're mapping hydrogen in three dimensions, both across the sky and as a function of distance from us. So how accurate can you be in your slicing in terms of depth, which means in terms of time? Uh, how, how fine can we draw this picture? We can, in fact, slice this uh, Swiss cheese of, of hydrogen in a very fine slices. But um, in order for us to see significant variations, we're adding up slices so that we can improve our signal um, but uh, we are tuning our resolution on the sky so that it will correspond to the characteristic size of a cavity that was produced by an early group of galaxies. So, so uh, how much time would then be between images that are reasonably well structured? We are talking about uh, tens of millions of years. Ten, that's very fine. That's tens very of fine. millions. So if, you, if you're if you're uh, looking between basically a hundred million years and a billion years into this very interesting period of the formation of first stars and first galaxies, if you can cut that into tens of millions of years, that's really a very uh, fine picture. That's We're getting a movie of how cosmic yeah. structure evolved with time. <laughs> Now, the interesting thing about it, um, at some point, we noticed that the, the biggest problem is the interference from radio and TV broadcasts on Earth. And that's one reason why uh, several of these experiments are being located in remote sites. Uh -huh. But then I uh, commented to a colleague of, a colleague of mine that uh, if our civilization is causing us trouble, perhaps we can also put limits on the existence of external civilizations because the same data set that we will collect will include information about interference from outside our planet. And we did a simple calculation. How far away would you be able to see the Earth as you take such an observatory and place it at a distance? Yes. Turns out that it can be tens of light years. Yes. We've been broadcasting TV and TV shows, radio shows, and as well as we've, we've been using uh, military radars for over 50 years. Right. So that means that the signals that we produced were able to reach distances of 50 light years. Yeah. And with the, the kind of observatories that we are now constructing, you could see the Earth <laughs> from those distances. So if there is anything out there, they may pick up the signals and be able to tell that we exist. I hope they're nice. Me too. <laughs> but based on our own experience, uh, the strongest signals that we produced were from um, warning systems for ballistic missiles. And if I had to guess, I would say that the brightest civilizations that they may exist, of course, we don't know if anything exists out there, but the brightest ones are probably militant. <laughs>